I'm going to start over okay. on this. Um, Let's see if I can tell it the same way twice. <laughs> that'd be fine. And, and uh, I had asked you uh, about where you were during this tank battle yeah. and uh, what involvement you had, if any, with actually disabling any of these tanks. Well, I didn't directly disable any of them. My unit disabled uh, quite a few of them. And, and uh, as I say, we got driven back about a mile. We had to relocate our command post and we had to improvise. Uh, but by that time, I had fully reverted back uh, to my job in regimental headquarters. No longer was I a combat patrol leader. No longer was I acting as a platoon leader or a, you know, sort of a junior company commander or something like that. I had, had reverted back to what uh, I was supposed to be doing. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that I was out of harm's way. Uh, uh, our regimental headquarters, uh, such as it was, uh, very informal, uh, was in a little farmhouse, uh, and German tanks got right in there. We got a point-blank shot right through the wall of the place, blew a hole about <laughs> seven feet in diameter uh, in the wall, and uh, fortunately, uh, the casualties were very light, and, and I got out without anything other than being kind of rocked and rolled a little. Uh, but I, 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 I saw the men do it. I know how they did it. I watched uh, the results and, and some of the action uh, as best I could, trying to stay out of harm's way uh, and, and perform the functions. As I say, my job was to get enough ammunition there, to get enough supplies there, enough weapons, uh, an, 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 enough transportation, all of those kind of things. And in addition to that, I had to do liaison work when we had to have it because we couldn't really keep track of the units on our right and left. Uh, we had no one but the 506 on our right and we had the swamp on our left and we had Germans to our front in the middle of us. Uh, and they were streaming in and with lots of get up and go and lots of good equipment. Uh, so it was, a, it was a busy day, but as the day ended, it, it uh, settled down a little and things got quieted and we, we went through the painful reorganization process that we had to do, uh, redistribution of manpower and, and command and control functions. And, uh, uh, were you taking many German POWs at, at this point? Did you had a, had you had any real uh, interaction with with Germans? Yes, I I had German POWs with me on D-Day. I had two of them with me. I didn't know what the Dickens to do with them. Uh, as I say on D-Day, what we did is we uh, uh, we had never been trained to do this, and maybe what we did was not in accordance with the Geneva Convention, but it worked, and it was humane. Of course, we threw their weapons away. Then some guy hit on the idea, well, you know, if they got to hold up their pants, make them take off their belts. And, and, and they had on baggy type uniforms like we did, so their pants were constantly sliding down, so they had to hold up their pants. Uh, and and uh, then we took their shoes off of them and threw those away. And so without shoes and having to hold up their pants, they behaved themselves pretty well. Uh, they weren't anxious to get killed by their own German soldiers and they weren't anxious to get killed by us. Uh, they were useless to us, they were a burden. And I put a couple of glider pilots that happened to be in our area uh, doing the guarding of them. The glider pilots only had pistols, and but they could guard these guys holding up their pants and, and trailing along behind us. And uh, then, but you know, we had been taught Never to shoot a prisoner. I won't say that the Geneva Convention wasn't disregarded in some instances by American soldiers, but we had learned that, and we were told over and over again, if you start shooting prisoners, they'll start shooting their prisoners. Uh, if you, you, you don't shoot prisoners, you treat them as humanely as you possibly can, but of course you don't go out of your way. So 
the, the American soldiers got the first aid first, and if there's any left over, the German soldiers got it. If we captured any German medics, we put them to use on their own soldiers real quickly. We made them nurse each other and, and things of that sort. As we corralled them and, and, and got rid of them, we passed them to the rear, where the, finally the military police would pick them up, and, and, and that was their job from then on. So uh, we tried to interrogate them as best we could but very quickly. We had uh, uh, people who spoke German uh, in our interrogation unit who were right a part of our, what we call our S2 section, our intelligence section. And uh, so, it, you know, uh, but the information they gave us was not that valuable. <laughs> Soldiers don't know a hell of a lot about what's going on, except what's going on immediately around them. You don't tell them too much, uh, because if they fall captive, you know, they can be interrogated. Uh, and so uh, that was the theory you worked on. If you don't, you only got information that you had to have in order to function. And we only passed out information that you had to have in order to function from the top down to the bottom of the whole military establishment. That was the rule. But uh, we treated the German soldiers as humanely as possible. And, and I, the battle finally got over, the lines were stabilized. Uh, we, at the end of the day, we were about at the same place we started that morning. And uh, it was a good defensive position, and we took over in that defensive position. And while we got some German harassment and some German patrols trying to penetrate us, we didn't get any heavy armor infantry attack, attack again. By that time, the Air Force was doing one tremendous job on beating up the German army. They had sort of isolated the battlefield. The Germans were having a hard time bringing in their reserves uh, across the river lines. The Seine had been isolated and the, the Loire had been isolated. And the railroad lines coming in, the highways coming in were on, under constant air attack. And while they got a lot through, uh, they weren't able to move their reserves as quickly as possible. So it was a it was a team operation, and uh, we had kept saying, well, when are they going to take us out of this battle? When are we going to get, when are we going back to England? When are we going to go back and get ready for the next airborne operation? Well, this was about D plus 10 or something like that. Finally, about D plus 15, they brought an infantry division up, relieved us. Uh, it took over our defensive positions, and and we were pulled back and transferred immediately to another front around St. Combe, excuse me, oh, I've forgotten the name of the town, in central, in the central part of the peninsula, uh, St. Sever Le Vacon. And we were there just a few days, and then they decided they had to use us to attack Cherbourg, and we pulled out of there on trucks that we were borrowed, had borrowed, uh, and, and moved up. Uh, to uh, the, the battle area around Cherbourg. Uh, Cherbourg fell a little easier than we had anticipated. Not that the capturing of Cherbourg was easy, but our part of it was easy. Okay, we, we proceed. See, we were uh, just finishing the capture of Cherbourg up here at the top of the, which had been the primary goal of our whole invasion effort. You've got to visualize now that all of the troops and all of the material were being l landed on the beaches and transported across the beaches. These are not ordinary beaches. These are beaches where the tide would rise and fall 18 feet at a time. Mm -hmm. And so the beaches were not always usable because they had to, you couldn't land a craft at at high tide and you couldn't get it off again until the next high tide which would be some 12 hours later so you had to they it was a slow tedious process of landing troops and landing equipment and supplies <clears throat> the whole part of the first part of invasion that we were involved in was to capture this port of Cherbourg mm -hmm. Cherbourg had been up to that time probably the most important port in France all of the transatlantic 
uh, steamship uh, things all called on Sherberg. Of course, they were interrupted by World War II. Sure, right. and, but it was a deep port, it was well developed, and it was a key element. And there were no more ports that would be available to us for months and months and months after that. So Sherberg was very important. It meant that you could bring troops straight from the United States and land them at Sherberg. They could get off of the ship uh, on a dock and walk to the vehicles, be mm -hmm. transported by rail or by, or by truck, and so could all the equipment that we needed for the rest of the war be done there. And we knew there were no other ports in that part of the world that we would have control of before Christmas time. So Sherberg became the important objective. And the Germans understood that, uh, so they defended Sherberg, and they had tremendous amounts of troops in, in that area, and they defended it as best they could for a long time. Finally, by, for me, by the 4th of July, Sherberg was captured. Actually, it was captured a little before that, but I, it wasn't fit to go in town because there were still German soldiers around there, and uh, it was still a messed up area. And so I went to town about on the 4th of July of 1944, and uh, I said, well, you know, I'm going down to the beach, and, and, I, and, I, and I got Britt, my driver, I said, let's go down to the beach. I want to I'm, I want to take a bath. I haven't had a bath in about six weeks. I smell like the devil, and and I'm going to just take off my clothes, and I'm going swimming. Into the ocean, into the water. Into the ocean. Boy, was that a mistake. About the time I got up to my knees, I realized how cold that water was. Well, for a, even for a New York Yankee, it would have been cold, but for a Florida cracker, I think I got wet about two inches above my knees, and I got out of there. Uh, drove back into Sherberg, uh, found a public bath. Hmm. Public baths were very prominent in that part of the world at that time, and the Germans had been using it. it was still in operation. Uh, somehow they had hot water, and I went in and took a shower. Hmm. Uh, came out and put on the same stinking clothes I'd had on for six weeks and or four weeks, five weeks. And uh, and and uh, by that time we were in a rest area. Uh, they had told us we, you're going to be recycled back to England real quick now. And sure enough, within a few days after the 4th of July, I was sent back in e to England as an advanced person for the 501st in order to corral the transportation, uh, get the, 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 our, our camp opened up, mm -hmm. and to get going again. And I met the 501 at the docks in Southampton, oh, about the 7th or 8th, maybe the 10th of July. We had enough trucks for about 600 people, and frankly, we didn't fill them up. Mm -hmm. Now, that contrasts with the fact that we'd taken in about 2,000 into that operation. Hmm. Uh, and we went back to the camp, and everybody got washed up, cleaned up, uh, got a good meal from the company, from the battalion kitchens, and, and uh, we began to function like human beings again. How long were you there for? Well, we had... The 501 had closed into that place in January of 44. This was July of 44. Uh, we had been in and out of that camp uh, all of that time, uh, except for about a, a little over a month uh, that we were in either in isolation or in the invasion. And so it was home. Uh, uh, the little town of Newbury was just a couple of miles away. Uh, there was a cinema there, moving picture show. Uh, there were pubs. So it was a uh, bit of, re uh, re 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 you recuperated as well as getting ready. Oh boy, did we recuperate. We were all told, well, you'll get five days of leave uh, and uh, you're on your own. Uh, now, we didn't all go at one time. We went just uh, small groups at a time. I was anxious to try to find my brother, Myron, 
I was getting mail from home that they knew he was in the European theater of operations. They didn't know where he was. Uh, by that time, they knew he was on the European continent. He apparently entered the European continent about the same time I left, as best we can tell. He came across probably uh, Utah Beach, was moved up to fight the Battle of St. Lo, and then they drove on from there after a horrendous battle uh, into into uh, into southern France or south, it was really eastern central France, uh, where f for the third time my brother picked up a Purple Heart. This time he had to be airy vacked uh, back to England because he was so badly wounded. Uh, he uh, had been a sergeant in G Company of the 320th Infantry of the 35th Infantry Division. And he had been the company uh, runner. Uh, he, radios and, tele, and, and telephones didn't work very well in combat. Uh, and so you had to depend upon personally delivered messages. And so the company commander had a, had a runner that would take the messages out to the platoon leaders and bring messages back and forth. A dangerous job because you're up and on your feet and moving when you ought to be on your stomach uh, laying down or in a hole someplace. And he had picked up three Purple Hearts. The third Purple Heart was in a little town called Chartay Dun, uh, south of Chartres on a small river. And he had been badly injured. I first learned of it when a man who had been working with us, one of the aid men, came back and he said, Captain Gibbons, I have just seen your brother. He, he is being ev e air evac uh, to Grenham Commons where we are working with the planes, taking them off, putting them on transportation, getting them to the hospitals. Mm -hmm. And he, he recognized me as being a paratrooper and he said, do you know my brother? And the guy said, oh yeah, I know him. And I'm gonna have supper with him tonight. And so he did. He told me where my brother was, where he was going. I got a Jeep and took off and drove through the night and finally ran into my brother in a hospital uh, in Herefordshire. Oh, about four hours drive from where I was uh, uh, in blackout in the middle of the night. Hmm. And uh, he was propped up in bed. He was undressed from the waist down because he was, most of his wounds had been in his left and right thighs. He was alive. He was sick as hell. And, 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 but we visited for a few minutes and the people at the hospital gave me a bed and I slept a few hours and got up and visited with him the next morning and that afternoon I went back to my camp and I had to write my folks and tell them all about it and assure him that he was going to live and he was getting good medical care and that that I didn't know how his legs were going to work but you know he, he, he was alive. Mm -hmm. Well he stayed in the hospital off and on for a year. Finally was evacuated back to the United States around Christmas time. And then by the early summer, he got out and started law school at the University of Florida. Uh, so that completes that chapter. We, we would then begin to prepare for what turned out to be an operation called Market Garden. Now, we had prepared and gotten ready to jump on other places. We, the way they were using parachute troops in was to bridge geographic barriers, uh, river lines, uh, choke points, and things of that sort. And they would drop us behind there. We'd secure it from the rear and then welcome the troops in from the other side. Uh, and, and so we had done that. A number of them had been, all of them had been called off because the American forces were advancing and the British forces were advancing so fast. And, and so by September the 17th, uh, we were approaching the Rhine River. And they had to get across the Rhine River and, and they dreamed up something called Market Garden. The idea of it was to dump, dump parachutist out in front of the British Army, which was invading in that area, which was fighting in that area, and we would br bridge the Rhine River and get over into, into central Germany and from there to, uh, 
to uh, Berlin was only about 150 miles and it was flat country and it would have been duck soup had we been successful, but Market Garden failed. And uh, we knew it was a failure from real early in the thing because uh, uh, it, it, it just was too much and too, we had too little to do it with. Okay, we're, we're going to continue talking about Market Garden. All right. And, uh, I'd like to know, we'll, we'll continue talking about that, and which bridge you were ordered to defend. All right, okay, fine. <laughs> well, uh, Market Garden was a, one of those emergency plans that came up very quickly. Uh, we had to adapt very quickly to it, and frankly, intelligence being what it is, is I'm talking about intelligence, what the enemy is doing, what they're capable of doing, was not that good. Uh, and the Germans had moved in a couple of uh, armored divisions uh, into that area uh, on the other side of the river. In Market Garden, it was a combined uh, British infantry, British parachute, and, and American parachute operation. There were two American divisions, the 101st by division, and the 82nd Airborne Division involved in it, and then there was the British 6th Airborne Division involved in it. Uh, there were a scattering of other troops that were not significant uh, as far as airborne operations was concerned. Market Garden was to be a daylight operation instead of a midnight operation. Uh, it, uh, it, there were more troop carrier planes available. We were able to move larger amounts of our people into the battle area. And uh, Market Garden took place in Holland, or the Netherlands as they're called. And essentially the British Army was north of uh, Brussels, Belgium, and Market Garden had been, or Holland, or the Netherlands had been occupied by the Germans since 1940 and uh, was right of course on the split by the Rhine River and its tributaries and there were lots of those and uh, it w but if you could get across the Rhine River at that area you had you had Berlin in your eyesights and we were kept thinking optimistically, uh, <laughs> but fant fantasy that, you know, this, we're going to have this thing over, this war over by Christmas time. Hmm. Uh, and that was the, the aim of it. Well, here on September the 17th, uh, uh, the was a Sunday. Uh, uh, we took off around a little after daylight and got together and get, got the planes all together in formation and took off for the Netherlands. And the drop, the 501, my unit, 2,000 men, uh, by that time we had had our strength replenished by replacements and some of the folks who were not badly wounded had come out of the hospital and so we were, uh, I guess, 40, maybe 50 percent new men, new officers, new enlisted men, uh, and and the rest of us were what you would call veterans. Uh, let me, the tension leading up to Market Garden is something that I hadn't noticed in the invasion, particularly amongst those who had been in combat. There was more tension amongst the men because they realized what they were getting into than there had been before D-Day. And frankly, it caused us some problems. We had a suicide in, at a higher level in the division uh, staff. We had self meanings We had a few desertions. They just couldn't put it all back together again is what in the minds of some of the people. A few officers, a few men, uh, it wasn't bad, it wasn't, but it was it was something I was beginning to learn. In, on D-Day we had all been 
freshmen. We didn't know what the heck we were getting into. We thought we did. But by now you did. But by now we knew what is, was ahead of us, and some had said, well, you know, I'm opting out. Uh, <laughs> and so we had a little problem with that, but not a serious problem. Uh, and uh, the, the drop went perfectly. From my point of view, I landed real near where I was supposed to drop, around the little town of Veckel in Holland. And it, it, essentially, uh, there was German resistance, but uh, in, on the ground, there was lots of anti-aircraft fire. We lost some planes going in. We had some people killed in those planes. and uh, But essentially, we landed about where we were supposed to. Not exactly, but compared to D-Day, it was perfect. <laughs> as far as the execution of the parachute drop was concerned. Uh, we got together quickly, we moved out quickly, we secured the bridges that we were supposed to secure. As I say, the Rhine, had a num the Rhine River had a number of tributaries running off of it, going through Holland. Our bridges were mainly small uh, rivers and canals that we had to get. Uh, they weren't really small, they were essential bridges, some of them were quite extensive. We got them. Uh, the German resistance quickly developed. Uh, the casualties began to mount. Uh, but the British, who had the toughest part of the operation, which was to drop on the far side of the uh, Rhine River as it flowed through the town of Arnheim, uh, had dropped some distance from their bridges, maybe four or five miles. They didn't drop as close to the bridges as perhaps we would have tried, but you know, they had, they had to make their own decisions. And they dropped on top of two German armored divisions that we didn't even know about. Mm. Well, those German armored divisions immediately started tearing them up. Uh, they had tanks, they were well-trained uh, armored division troops and the British airborne unit took in 10,000 men and brought out about 2,000. They were slaughtered. They fought well, they fought as best they could. Uh, they finally reached the bridge that they were supposed to greet, reach, which was a very large bridge and a long bridge. They were able to secure one end of it, but they were not able to get across the bridge and secure the other end of it. And the 82nd Division was so far away securing its bridge down at Nijmegen that they couldn't get up there in time to, to, to control the bridge, which was the key factor in, in the whole advance. And it was a very risky operation because, you know, the Germans had bombers. They had, they had prepared the bridge for destruction anyway. Uh, all bridges were prepared for destruction. And uh, so it, it just didn't work. Well, it became evident real quickly to all of us on the ground, no matter where we are, if our part of the operation worked, if the rest of it, the key place didn't work, the operation was a failure. And so uh, uh, I was in my regimental staff position. Uh, uh, essentially, the whole thing bogged down. We had a lot of trouble. There was a lot of German resistance on the ground. Uh, but the British were able to bring up finally enough forces so that there was no danger of us getting overrun by the Germans. And about that time, uh, the, the Colonel Johnson, who had been our regimental commander, said, Gibbons, I'm getting some flack from division headquarters about the, what's going on back there in Newbury. You go back there and take charge of that operation at Newbury. That was our base camp in, in, in England. At, and he said, I want you to whip those guys under control. They were, get, were getting people back from the hospitals. And, and replacements were beginning to come in and they were, instead of funneling them into Europe, they were funneling into, into our, our place at Hempstead Marshall near Newbury. And and, and he and the division commander uh, apparently was telling him, you know, things are chaotic over there, we're having trouble. Uh, you you got to 
get control of that, Colonel Johnson. So he sent me back to take control of it. Well, so I went back and got on a plane at Brussels and flew back to Newbury and, and, and uh, went over and took command of that operation. Uh, and, you know, it was a, it was unusual. I had, you, you had a lot of guys who thought they, who were out of hospitals. They wanted, some of them wanted to join their units. Others didn't give a hoot if they ever saw them again. And other, we had new people coming in and we had all this uh, uh, other people being transferred to hospitals from the, the Holland area. Uh, and it was a chaotic job, but I enjoyed it and, and uh, we got it done. And uh, finally we closed that operation out and rejoined the, the regiment, which by almost Thanksgiving time, after they spent a miserable time up there in Holland, uh, fighting and defending that area, uh, all for no apparent avail because we couldn't get across the Rhine River, mm -hmm. so the whole thing had been a failure as far as we were concerned. But uh, about Thanksgiving time, they began to pull us out of there, and we regrouped in a little town called montmelon le grand in northern France. Uh, there was nothing grand about Montmelon. <laughs> they kept there were two Mormelons and one was Mormelon Petit and the other was La Grande. And it had been an old uh, French uh, barracks in, I think, the Franco-Prussian War, but at least it had walls, it had roof, it had some inside plumbing, and it was grandiose to us. We hadn't been in that since we'd been in the States. In fact, even in the States, we were always in, in, in temporary camps. And uh, it was clean. Uh, it was fairly comfortable. The winter was setting in. It was miserably cold. And we were just living like kings there at Montmelon Le Grand. Uh, now, Montmelon Le Grand was about 15 miles east of Reims. R-H-E-I-M-S, the great cathedral town in northern France. And on the, every other day, the 82nd would come into town, and every other day, the, the uh, 101st came into town. We never put the two of them in town at the same time. Uh, Reims couldn't stand it. Uh, and uh, that's where we were when the Battle well, of the Bulge, Bulge broke out. Which we're, which we're going to get to in, the next, in our next session. Yes. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, uh, life at Montmelon was pleasant. Uh, my brother was still in the hospital in, in England. Uh, I was, my grandmother had died. Uh, my grandmother Gibbons had died in March of that year. And uh, my grandmother Crawley had died in, oh, 1941 or early 42. So uh, I had not been at home for the, for the, for the family grief uh, of two wonderful grandparents. Mm -hmm. We continue, and we're uh, now talking about the town of Baston. Sure. Well, remember we were pulled out of... Uh, Holland in late November. I can't remember the exact date. We pulled out, not all together, but some at a time, and congregated there in the camp at, at um, Montmelon Le Grand. We immediately began to receive replacements for the people that we had lost. Now, we lost about almost 50% maybe a little more than 50% of our people in Normandy who had been with us when we came overseas. We had to do some real retraining of units, getting them together as teams, getting them to know each other and to work with each other and to function as teams. We had to begin to replace their worn out clothing and their worn out weapons and that just takes time and we were anxious to get a little uh, recreation and, and time off. Uh, it so happened that I, in, in this time I never got any time off. Uh, 
Uh, my last time off had been in, in right after, uh, in, in early July, after coming back from Normandy. And uh, then uh, it was beginning to get extremely cold. Uh, we had settled into, into training and replacement and re-equipment type operations. Supplies were slow. We had not gotten our replacement clothing that we needed. We didn't have winter clothing available to us. Uh, any particular winter garb. We had just the same old thing that all soldiers had. And, uh, uh, but we were thanking God that we were safe and sound there at Montmelon. And then uh, toward the middle of December, uh, the Battle of the Bulge broke out. I forget the exact date. It was probably about December the 16th or 17th or 18th or something like that. Uh, there was a hurried meeting of uh, the regimental commanders at uh, uh, division headquarters there in Montmelon. Uh, they got the word that we had to move out and go up and take part in this uh, breakthrough that was occurring. We had lost our regimental commander, Colonel Johnson, in Holland. He had been killed uh, in, in one of the battles up there. And Colonel Julian Ewell, uh, who had been the regimental exec when I first joined the unit in, back in 1942, uh, had become the regimental commander. Uh, and uh, there had been a whole lot of changes in the whole operation. Uh, I, I compare a, a combat unit like the 501 to a long, long train ride. The train stops at some stations, some people get off and other people get on. Some are dead, some are injured, some return, but essentially people get on and off and finally by the time you get to the end of the trip there are not many <laughs> on the trip that started with you and certainly we were well into that process by that time. Well uh, Colonel Yule because he was familiar with the area around where we were going was asked to take his unit the 501 up there first and so we got the priority on the first transportation we loaded on open trucks uh, in extremely cold weather with whatever gear we had and and it hadn't started snowing by that time we'd had some flurries but no snowstorms and the weather was cold it was damp uh, we got to the little town of Bastogne where we were ordered to detruck and we jumped off the back of trucks this time and and and, and took off uh, to uh, meet the enemy wherever they may be and so we had, we moved e eastward out of uh, the Bastogne area uh, to run into the German forces, and we did very quickly. Uh, that battle uh, developed into a tremendous battle. Uh, the town of Bastogne was a town of maybe 6,000 people. It was a little uh, Belgium town uh, near the German border. Uh, near Luxembourg, near France, nothing is very far apart in Belgium. Uh, some of the people spoke French, some of the people spoke Flemish, some of the people spoke German. Uh, it was a conglomerate type thing, not that we had that much contact with the people of the town, uh, but that's the environment. It was an interesting town, it had a railroad running through it, and it had Five roads met there. Why did the battle break out there? Well, it broke out there because that was the historic invasion route between uh, Germany and France. The German armies would normally sweep through Belgium, come in the northern border of France, because a little south of there the terrain was too rough, and north of there where there were too many rivers. And so it was a natural invasion area into that area of France that armies had been using for centuries, and certainly the Germans knew it. That was a way to come into that area in, in the 1940s. 
uh, and there were lots of they were on the west side of the Rhine River mm -hmm. so they didn't have to worry about getting people across bridges uh, they uh, they had lots of heavy fog that they could conceal themselves in so they put together a huge German force there without detection and the Americans uh, which this was in the American sector, the north end of an American sector, and, and we just didn't have enough troops to man it. Mm -hmm. And we had brand new divisions who had just gotten to Europe and just come from Cherbourg up to, uh, to uh, those places and had just taken over and relieved uh, the other combat units there who'd gone back for refitting and replacement and some rest. Uh, and and uh, they were good troops, but you know, they just got overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. The Germans hit them with a lot of force, and hit them with a lot of drive, and they penetrated the divisions in about a day, and and by a day and a half they were through all that defense line and just out in open territory, rolling with their tanks and their infantry and everything else. The weather was decent; it was cold. But the weather was decent, and they were they were moving, and their their mission had been to sh break through that area, capture Brussels, and then go right straight to the coastline and split the American army off from the British army. That was their strategy, using this old invasion route that they had gone through uh, for centuries. How long did this defensive take? Well, it it started in about the 18th to the 20th of December, as I recall. And, you know, we didn't get that thing straightened out until about uh, January the 20th. So it took a month, and it was a month of miserable fighting. Uh, shortly, the 501 ran into heavy German penetrations. Uh, we did the best we could. We uh, dug in around the and deployed around the little town of Bastogne uh, to the east and north side. And the rest of the, uh, the uh, 101st Airborne Divisions came in and finally built a circle around that town of Bastogne. Mm -hmm. And the Germans tried to penetrate it, but they just finally bypassed it and, and brought in other troops uh, to, to try to annihilate us. And they had tried everything. They tried bombing, they tried heavy artillery, they tried tank attacks, they tried infantry and tank attacks. And, uh, you know, uh, then the famous nuts provision started. Uh, well, right, they asked you guys they asked to, you surrender. to surrender. Yeah. Now, let me tell what I think happened. I, you know, there are lots of written explanations of what happened. Oh yes, by oh, about the, the people with the shoes that, that didn't protect him at all. Oh, I I forgot to cover that. Thank you, Martha. We had no winter equipment. Mm -hmm. Some of our soldiers may have luckily had overshoes, wooden. I mean, rubber boots that you could pull up over your combat boots, uh, and. But we had no woolen uniform. We had no. We had woolen uniforms, but we had no. Uh, we had no really parkers or things like mm -hmm. that. We had the old army overcoat, and 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 uh, we just were not prepared for the winter. Uh, and and we d did not have all of our weapons replaced. Uh, we did not have all the people fully integrated into the, the unit. The new people. Uh, we were not as well prepared as we should have, could have possibly been had we, <laughs> had we realized what was going to happen. But this was a surprise, and, and nobody anticipated the Germans were going to do this. They'd done it stealthily, they'd done it, uh, they'd done it with a great amount of secrecy and, and a great amount of uh, competentness. They were very competent in doing this. and. They really hit the American army and just split it badly. Uh, the weather. Uh, shortly after we got there, it began to rain, and then the rain turned to snow. Mm. 
and then the snow got deeper and deeper. And finally, most of the German units were forced off of the countryside onto the road networks. Mm -hmm. And that is when Bastogne really became important because it was a node road network center and they had to get Bastogne. And we were there and they had to beat us in order to get Bastogne. And finally, they were good, completely surrounded us, cut us off. We could not evacuate the wounded. We could not get any supplies. Uh, we were running. You were in our own church. We were, yes, we were running low on uh, food. We were running low on ammunition. We were certainly running low on gasoline for our vehicles. We didn't have very many vehicles. There were some tank destroyer units who had been in that area and who had retreated and helped us there in the defense of Bastogne. Not many and certainly not near enough, but uh, they were very helpful and their radios were better than ours and just to have a tank around you, particularly a tank destroyer was kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a morale builder. Uh, so we don't want to underestimate the, what they contributed to all of that, but essentially it became an infantry battle. Now. We weren't prepared as far as the type of equipment to concern, but mentally we were prepared for the defense of that. And we had been, our doctrine, our training had been that we could fight in isolation, surrounded. And so, you know, we were back to where we had been basically trained for, to fight in isolation, to hold on and fight like hell. And that's what the, what the units did. Now, ultimately comes the German surrender offer. Uh, they uh, sent uh, a couple of ranking officers over and with a, a note from the German commander to surrender and, and the note finally got back to division headquarters where uh, General McAuliffe who had was uh, assistant division commander had was commanding the, our, our General Taylor had been ordered back to the United States to do some special briefing with the War Department there. And uh, so uh, McAuliffe eventually got the note. A man by the name of Kennard, who at that time was a lieutenant colonel, or maybe he was a full colonel by that time. He, was a, he had been in the 501. He, had he and I had jumped out of the same plane together in Normandy. Uh, on D plus one, I had been in his unit under his command uh, as we attacked out of uh, that area. Uh, and so I knew Kennard very well. Excellent infantry officer. Uh, he had moved to division headquarters uh, when they had had some change in their staff uh, after Normandy and had essentially been the plans and operations officer of the division. Uh, uh, well, I think it was Kennard who dreamed up the message of nuts. That he wrote nuts back to the German. I, I, it is so Kennard-like. He was a man who did not use profanity. He was an excellently trained West Point graduate. Uh, and I had heard him use the phrase nuts before. Hmm. When, you know, when you're searching for a word and you want to give a negative sign, you say nuts. Uh, you know. Uh, he, he was an even-tempered even fella, and I think he's the guy that came up with nuts. I've asked him about it, but he does not claim the no, authorship, but it's pure canard through and through. And so he comes up with that answer to the German commander of nuts. Well, you know, us fellas down on the, at our level, we didn't know anything about that. The division headquarters was not very far from where our headquarters where it was. Uh, McAuliffe is given the credit for it. Yeah, McAuliffe is given the credit for it, and you know he, after after all, he had to sign the note, and uh, so he he deserves it. Anyway, uh, I think it was pure canard, and 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 I give him credit for it. We were all gathered around this little town of Bastogne. It, the defense perimeter, in its circumference couldn't have been more than six miles around. Uh, the, the defense line from the town 
was at varying distances at different times in the battle, but it, it essentially it, you could practically see the soldiers from the town. Mm -hmm. uh, they were fighting in planted forests. They were fighting in fields that were covered with snow. Uh, they were fighting defending roads uh, leading into the town that the Germans were able to clear with their uh, road clearing equipment. And they were catching hell. Mm -hmm. uh, we were being bombed every night by the Luftwaffe. We were being shelled all day and all night by the German uh, artillery. Uh, we were being pressed all the time by the German tanks and the German infantry. And it was a miserable, miserable occasion. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we held out. Were you surprised that the Germans still had all this striking power? Oh, yeah, it, we were. We had thought the Germans were defeated when we broke out of Normandy. We thought the Germans were defeated uh, when they had retreated all the way to their own uh, really country boundaries just about to the Siegfried line. But we knew they were putting up a stubborn resistance to the Americans and British trying to penetrate that area where they were and we just didn't know they had that much fight in them. So we were surprised, uh, disappointed and uh, uh, had another job to do. We lost a heck of a lot of people. Most of them to wounds, a uh, great many dead, uh, but the weather played a terribly important role and we began to have frostbite, trench foot, all those kind of exhaustions that come on the human body when you're exposed to that kind of temperature. It was supposed to have been the coldest winter in 40 years. And the snow was deep, and in some places was very deep, and it was just all over the place. The Germans had camouflage uniforms. We were still in our greens. Uh, occasionally we could steal a sheet or a window curtain or something like that and pretend to be camouflaged. Uh, too many of our men didn't have any extra protection for their feet. Uh, they couldn't keep them warm. And despite everything that we could do, we were getting a lot of trench foot and a lot of exhaustion just from the cold and from the stress of all of it. Well, thank God the American forces finally broke through. Uh, we got an aerial resupply mission that was helpful in resupplying ammunition. And, and we had wounded in the town uh, that we couldn't evacuate. Uh, our hosp our Aid stations were down to not even a good fresh bandage, and certainly they had run out of all the antibiotics and all the miracle medicines that had just become available to us. And it was a, it was a miserable situation. There were lots of civilians were being killed uh, in the town. We had we had been able to set up our <coughs> division, our regimental command post in a in what had been a Catholic school and a small church connected with it. The Catholic school was manned primarily by nuns. Uh, the building was very substantial. It had an excellent basement, thank God. And the walls were thick. It was very prominent. The, the Germans couldn't help but see it. It was on the northeast end of town. And they just gave us fits firing artillery into that, but uh, it was better than being out in the, cold. in the cold, not that it wasn't cold. I must say in combat, the first thing we learned to do was knock all the windows out of a building because if you're being shot at in combat, particularly by mortars or artillery, when a shell explodes, even if it doesn't hit you, it blows the windows out and the windows become death. So the first thing we had to do was knock the windows out. Then we had to find something to block out as much of the cold as we could. Uh, we used everything under the sun to do that. Boards, anything we could put in the windows we did. And it was habitable there. And uh, what kitchens we had were set up there. Uh, but we ran out of food. Fortunately, there was a lot of donut flour in town. There had been a Red Cross unit there that was supplying coffee and donuts to the troops up on the, uh, on the then rather 
the forest rather static front and in their haste to get out of town they left all the donut flour there so our cooks made uh, syrup out of the sugar and pancakes out of the donut flour and those of us who had any hot meals could get syrupy sugary pancakes <laughs> the poor guys out on the thing had K rations and maybe occasionally a hot drink or something that was supposed to resemble coffee and but there was not much of that we were only able to get them emergency rations because it's just too much combat and they couldn't feed them anyway okay I think we're gonna stop there because we're shortly running out of tape and I think that's a good place to stop well good I'll see you next Friday okay and I really I appreciate you working with with us on this and you're very easy to talk to and it seems and, and it's very vivid pictures and we appreciate you sharing your memories with us oh thank you